Hello everyone, <coughs> my name is Tomasz Praszkowski and I'm Cloud Solution Engineer uh, in Intel. Today's talk is OpenStack on Kubernetes, one year after. Agenda for today's talk is pretty simple. So first we will focus on what was motivation behind this initiative, what's the current landscape, how was the evolution during last year, and there will be a short section for Q&A. So, I was part of the team that was responsible for preparing OpenStack on Kubernetes demo uh, for a keynote session in Open, on OpenStack Summit in Austin in 2016. <clears throat> it was uh, well received and it was very successful. But the main goal for that was that we wanted to uh, make, simply make things easier. So, and by making things easier, we understood that uh, we OpenStack lifecycle management was quite complex, and uh, as OpenStack is simply just an application, but a really complex one, putting it on top of uh, Kubernetes will help to orchestrate its deployments, but would also simplify second-day maintenance. <coughs> OpenStack community put a lot of effort into making rolling upgrades of OpenStack itself possible, but still there was no tool which can orchestrate those upgrades, and we wanted Kubernetes to become that tool. And Kubernetes also offers a modern way for a HA, so everyone who is aware of Pacemaker, so I really like don't, that solution, so everyone who used Pacemaker, Pacemaker and Kubernetes knows that Kubernetes is far more advanced and far more user-friendly than Pacemaker. And the other motivation was that we wanted uh, data center op operators and users to offer a, a solution or a platform which can help them to utilize their, ma max to maximize their infrastructure utilization. The advantage of the public cloud operators is that they have, they have put significant R&D into making sure that they can extract as much as they can from their uh, bare metal resources. And this is not simply possible for a smaller companies and with approach that we can put containers and VMs on the same set of machines, we can put this utilization slightly higher. And we also wanted OpenStack to become the first class citizen on top of Kubernetes and vice versa. As we have seen on this summit, uh, Kubernetes is a very popular application which is deployed on top of OpenStack, as OpenStack offers a lot of advantages. And this is more or less how part of the OpenStack deployment looked like on top of Kubernetes a year ago, and today it looks the same. It's still a couple of pods, some Kubernetes controller, some Kubernetes service, and some ingress controller for that. But what has changed over the last year that the ecosystem is much more richer. So we have multiple solutions. So one of them is Fuel CCP, which is only one which offers full rolling upgrade. So with Fuel CCP, you can simply migrate from uh, Newton to Mitaka without the downtime on data plane and without very small downtime on control plane. There is also Kola Kubernetes. There are two OpenStack Helm projects where one is uh, vendor driven by SAP and there is also Stacanetis. Uh, all those projects differ somehow, but there are also projects which are strictly focusing on delivering just container images. And there is a Cola, which was the first and the most richest one so far. There is Loki, uh, which was recently introduced, and it seems to be quite successful, as it offers like really simple, simple containers and lightweight containers. And you can also use containers built by Fuel CCP, although you need to use their own specific tooling to be able to take advantage of those images. And each of those products or solutions is using different tools to deploy containers to the Kubernetes and template configuration files. So Stacanetis was using KPM. Fuel CCP is having their own uh, custom tooling written in Python, which is taking advantage of Jinja templates. Kola Kubernetes went for somehow hybrid. Uh, Type. So they are using Ansible with Jinja to template configuration file, and then they are calling Helm to deploy containers to the Kubernetes. And then there is also OpenStack Helm project, which was recently put into the OpenStack family, which is entirely Helm, and it's using Go templating for uh, configuration file templates. So those all projects differ somehow, but at the end the goal is the same, to put OpenStack on top of Kubernetes, and try to solve the, the second maintenance issues 
with orchestrating rolling upgrades for OpenStack. And how was the evolution of all those solutions for OpenStack deployment on top of Kubernetes during the last year? It was mostly driven not by the OpenStack development pace, but how Kubernetes was developed and what was the pace of Kubernetes development. So initially, when we started to work on Stacanetis, uh, the stable release of Kubernetes was 1.2. And right now we have 1.7, so there, was, there is a lot of stuff that changed in the meantime. Uh, but first we uh, started for using daemon sets uh, for pods that we wanted to make sure that there is only one pod per machine running. So this is the case, let's say, for Nova Compute, uh, for a libvirt, open with uh, neutron agents, and so on. But daemon set on that time has like significant disadvantage that simply was not offering rolling upgrade. So there was no possible to do the rolling upgrade on the daemon set. And one of the reasons why we went with OpenStack to Kubernetes was that we can simply upgrade OpenStack. <laughs> and th this was uh, hopefully fixed, or it's, it's actually fixed in Kubernetes 1.7, but it took some time Kubernetes community to fix that. And the other disadvantage of daemon set is that it's not supporting drain by, by design. And why this is important for OpenStack on Kubernetes deployment, I will tell it a few slides later. And also, daemon set requires you that if you want this specific pod to deploy it on a machine, you need to label this machine, of course, assuming that you want to limit what kind of, which machines are used for control pane and which machines are used for hosting the VMs. With deployment, the case was slightly different. So deployment from the very beginning was offering rolling upgrades. So it was possible to upgrade your application using native Kubernetes uh, features. Uh, but until Kubernetes 1.4, it was not really possible to tell that I want each pod of this controller to be deployed on the separate machine. So let's say you have your uh, Nova API service. You deploy Nova API in three instances, and you want to make sure that each of those instances would land on a separate machine, uh, because this is how HI should work in data center. Uh, before Kubernetes 1.4, it was not possible, but Kubernetes 1.4 introduced feature which, was, which is called node affinity and anti-affinity, so I can simply tell Kubernetes that uh, this controller uh, should make sure that each pod of this controller would land on a different node. So there will be no pods from the, single, from the same controller on the same node. And uh, the other nice feature that, was, that landed in Kubernetes 1.4 that's also using node affinity that I no longer need to use labels uh, to select on which machines which machines I would like to use for control plane, I can simply put machine names into the manifest using regex. And like, as you can see on the example, I can simply say that this, those specific pods should land on those three machines. So let's say I'm having three control plane machines and I can tell that those pods should land on just those three machines. And there is also pod affinity. So when you look uh, let, at Nova Compute, you usually want Nova Compute to be run along uh, libvirt, because simply to launch VMs, you need libvirt. And with pod affinity, you can tell Kubernetes that as, as soon as Nova Compute pod would land on this node, please also deploy libvirt container on this node. And this applies to neutron agents as well. So if uh, there is open vSwitch, Neutron open vSwitch agent running on this host, please make sure to deploy open vSwitch vSwitch D and open vSwitch DB server on this host as well. But the downside of the deployment is when you expand your cluster and you want to increase the number of compute nodes, uh, so you simply need to increase the number of replicas, let's say, of Nova Compute. But increasing the number of replicas of Nova Compute is simply not enough because you also need to increase the number of replicas uh, for libvirt, so that you have both containers on the same number of replicas on the cluster. <coughs> and the last thing is the pod layout. So initially, uh, because there was no uh, pod affinity and anti-affinity to make sure that Neutron Open vSwitch agent would also be deployed together with vSwitch D and DB server, we were combining those three containers within the single pod. Uh, but this has some disadvantages, again. For example, when you update Neutron Open vSwitch agent, 
uh, it requires that you restart all containers in the pod, and it meant that you also restarted vSwitchD at DB server, and it meant that all the services that were running on this server were simply not having network. So that's why most of the deployments nowadays went uh, for a model where each pod is having just a single container. So whenever you upgrade application in that container, only this application is affected. So there is no uh, downtime distribution when you upgrade application. And this was also not a rule a year ago. And going back to the drains, I, I mentioned that uh, daemon set is not supporting drains. So as I said at the beginning, we wanted to make things easier and simpler. And uh, Kubernetes has a very nice feature, which is called drain. So whenever you would like to put your node into the maintenance state, you can ask Kubernetes to remove all the containers which are running on this node and put them over the scheduler and put on a different node. And what we wanted that, uh, let's say, in OpenStack world, just killing the container with Nova Compute is not enough because you usually have virtual machines running on that machine. So if you want to make sure that those virtual machines would not be impacted by an upgrade or the machine maintenance, you need to live migrate them. And we came up with the solution, which we call Nova Kubernetes Drain, which simply listens to the uh, events on the Kubernetes events queue. And whenever there is a drain event, you also start live migration or virtual machines. So you simply ask in Kubernetes to empty the node from all the containers. And the Nova Kubernetes drain knows that and also tries to live migrate all of the machines uh, out of this machine. So you can simply and safely go with the maintenance and have no impact on the services running in your cluster. And also, uh, you can ask, so let's say you are run out of the capacity on a particular node as one of the applications or VMs consumed too much. You can, with kubectl cordon, you can ask Kubernetes to not schedule any more containers on that. And Nova Kubernetes drain intercept, this, uh, intercept that as well and disables all future scheduling on that compute node as well. And it, of course, works the opposite side. So whenever you enable scheduling in Kubernetes, Nova Compute node is also enabled for scheduling in, in Kubernetes. And all this magic is implemented as lifecycle hook in Kubernetes. So whenever uh, there is an action to kill the container, Nova Kubernetes drain intercepts that and executes the live migration commands. And this feature works only on deployment controller. It does not work on the daemon set because daemon set was created just to hold infrastructure services like Fluentd, which should live as long as the machine is alive. So that, that's why it's not always a good idea to put an application inside a daemon set controller. And as I said, we st started our initiative with Kubernetes 1.2, and uh, it was a very funny thing that we wanted to start using config maps to store configuration files, but it turned out that those config maps when uh, mounted as a file, can be accessed only by the root user, and we wanted to run our containers as non-root user, so we needed to upgrade to a uh, development version of Kubernetes 1.3. There was, until Kubernetes 1.4, there was also a problem with delivering resolve.conf file to the containers which are running with host network configuration. Uh, so to work around, because when you were mounting config map, you were shadowing all the files that were present in that directory. So simply, there was no way like, that you wanted just to uh, shadow one file from etc. So in our case, resolve.conf, there was no way that you will not shadow all other files in etc directory. With Kubernetes 1.4, with introduction of subpath mechanism, you can select just a single file from the config map and explicitly say that the single file need to be mounted as the single file on the file system. And this was introduced in 1.4. Previously, we were just using Kubernetes entry point, which I will tell a slide later what it is, to copy the file uh, from the config map to the appropriate place in the file system in the container. And uh, with Kubernetes 1.4, there was another feature introduced for files that were mounted from config maps, because until 1.4, there was no way that you can write to the file which was mounted from the config map. It was enabled in 1.4, and it was uh, 
it was manifesting when we were deploying RabbitEMQ cluster, and there is file like RabbitEMQ cookie, cookie, which is containing some password for the RabbitEMQ cluster, and RabbitEMQ by default assumes that it can open it, and it can open it for write, and as config map files were not openable for write, it resulted in error, but hopefully it was fixed in Kubernetes 1.4. And going back to the Kubernetes entry point, so even today, Kubernetes itself is not having native dependency management mechanism. So we came up uh, with a simple, clever software, which is the initially was deployed inside the container uh, running as a wrapper, which was talking to Kubernetes API and checking if all the dependencies were resolved. So it's a very simple because every container uh, can access uh, Kubernetes API, and with help of that, you can check the state of other containers running. So let's say if Nova API is requiring uh, MySQL database to be running, you can check uh, MySQL service in Kubernetes if it's having endpoints, and those endpoints are in a okay state. And this applies to other services, like if, uh, let's say, Nova Compute requires Nova Conductor, uh, to be running, so you can check the same. So you can check if there are pods with Nova Conductor deploys, deployed on the cluster, and if there are deployed and their state is okay, then you can treat this dependency as resolved. And so the initial way of deploying was inside the container with the actual application. So it has some disadvantages because you need to, you cannot take simply any image from the internet and uh, put it in your cluster, so you need some custom build process. But with Kubernetes 1.3, there is so-called init container, so you can simply put Kubernetes entry point in init container and hold the execution of the application container until all dependencies are met. And when they are resolved, init container is exiting and then starting the actual application. And uh, Kubernetes entry point was developed as part of Stakanetis project, uh, but uh, it seems that it's no longer maintained, so if anyone is willing to, to maintain that part and to expand his Go skills, so everyone is welcome to join maintenance. And this has become really important as all, except few LCC projects, are using that part of orchestration. The other issue that we needed to resolve was how to safely deploy MySQL database on top of Kubernetes, uh, because you want some kind of HA, so your OpenStack deployment is always working. So, uh, Cola Kubernetes solved that by having just one replica of a database. It was a year ago, and they take advantage of the stateful set. So it means that uh, they had just one instance of database, which was having a storage deployed on top of Ceph using persistent volume claims. And when this database was down because of the host hosting this container was down, then Kubernetes was taking care to respawn this database in a different place of the cluster. But it meant that it was not full HA solution, so it was not active-active, it was active-passive. So the downtime was about a minute. So it's the time that is required for the Kubernetes to respawn a pod after a node failure. Uh, in Stakanetis, and uh, we in, from the beginning wanted to have a Galera, so we came up with some uh, clever software, uh, which was again talking to Kubernetes API and checking if there are other MySQL Galera members in the cluster, and if yes, this newly started container was joining them, and when it was a fresh database deployment, so we were just deploying OpenStack for the first time. The situation was detected as well, and there was a seed node started, which was doing all the database initialization and uh, connecting all other members, like let's say you have three replicas with this seed, and when all those three members connected, then the seed was exiting as it was just pure Kubernetes job. And uh, with that automation, we, would, we were able to avoid using pet sets or uh, stateful set, as it's nowadays called, but also stateful sets offer predictable host names in Kubernetes, uh, which is uh, sometimes usable uh, because you don't have this uh, random crap. And it's initially, until Kubernetes 1.4, it was the only controller which was supporting persistent volume claims.
and cron jobs. So as you probably notice, uh, most of the OpenStack on top of Kubernetes deployments are not or were not using Fernet tokens in Keystone uh, because there was a problem of rotating those tokens. So there was no Kubernetes native mechanism that can uh, predictably rotate those tokens. But the situation has changed in Kubernetes 1.6 as we finally have Kubernetes cron jobs. So we can simply have ask Kubernetes to rotate those tokens every five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour. So it depends how an operator wants that. Of course, previously, that's what that was possible as well. So you can simply launch a container uh, with simple bash script, which was doing an infinite loop, doing uh, token rotation, and, and then uh, sleeping again. But it required a lot of different tricks. So you needed to access the file system locally. So you needed to deploy those pods exactly on the place um, where the Keystone containers are running. With the Kubernetes cron jobs and with the help of pod affinity, you can always make sure that this job will run exactly at the place where the Keystone container is running, and you can safely rotate those tokens. Another uh, use case for this feature is removing that agents, as uh, Kubernetes containers are having those random host names. So let's say you have Nova API service, and every time when Nova API container is started, its name is Nova API, minus xxxx, some, some random string. And as, for example, you can have one node which is malfunctioning in your cluster or malfunctioning network, and it can result that Nova API container would be respond every 30, 45, 60 seconds. And it would mean that every time it will start, it will register in Nova as new agents. So you will have like thousands, hundreds of Nova API agents, which will like produce uh, a lot of dead agents. and usually you would like to remove that, those agents. And of course, you can have again a container which is running with infinite loop, which is checking for that situation and remove that. Or you can go to the Kubernetes cron job, which is every five minutes, every hour, or every day doing that check and removing that agents. So this is a really nice feature that would really help to keep the OpenStack deployments really clean. There was also a bunch of other improvements not necessarily related directly to OpenStack. So uh, before Mitaka, uh, live migration in OpenStack required that DNS in underlay was recognizing all host names in the cluster. And uh, when you deploy your cluster in a legacy way, this is usually true, but in more dynamic environment like Kubernetes, this is not always true. So this was a very helpful feature that you can simply uh, set in the configuration file that this is the IP address that should be used to live migrate virtual machines uh, to this specific compute node or out of this specific compute node. And as we know, we can easily extract IP address of the container when we start Nova Compute Service because we have environment variable which is telling the pod IP address. And what was what was really said when we discovered that that serial cinder volume. Uh, for Ceph use case was not having HA. And again, uh, because uh, container host names are dynamic, so let's say you have this Cinder volume service running and you create a volume. So this volume was connected with Cinder HA minus XXXX. And as this is a dynamic environment, this container can get killed and it would be respawned with, with a different host name. But for Cinder, it meant that this volume is no longer controllable because the syndrome, Cinder volume, which was the owner, uh, of this particular volume was dead, was no longer running. And even though the, everything was fine in the Ceph cluster, we had a lot of Cinder volume instances, we cannot manage the volume. So it was uh, fixed in Okata, and it definitely helps uh, for Cinder case on top of, of Kubernetes, and not many projects were aware of that. Uh, so the only project that were of, the, of that was FuelCCP and Stacanetis or others were never, never uh, fixed that issue with the older releases. And there was also a bunch of the work that happened in improving Neutron L3 agent uh, split brain. Uh, so when you, again, when you have this dynamic environment where your containers can be deployed as soon as the Kubernetes controller detects that there is a problem. So we can end up in a situation that some agents uh, are still running 
uh, and they think they are master from the VRP perspective, but it's enough only that they will uh, call to Neutron API to figure out that this is not necessarily true. And this is exactly what happened in Neutron uh, to improve that. So like we have much better split brain prevention in Okata right now. And there was also a lot of very exciting work happening in clustering RabbitEMQ on top of Kubernetes. So uh, with the help of auto cluster plugin and a lot of work that Mirantis did in hardening that plug plugin with a CD backend, we can say that we have like bullet proof clustering solution for RabbitEMQ on top of Kubernetes. And you can simply scale up, scale down, and the cluster still works. And of course, uh, it's really uh, bullet proof, so it can survive different uh, bad scenarios which are, could happen in your cl cluster as well. And the initial release, which could be considered production ready, was around Kubernetes 1.5. But as everyone uh, was progressing forward and forward and putting more and more components on, on top, um, OpenStack components of, on top of Kubernetes, uh, at some stage, we figured out that uh, simple is not that simple, that uh, OpenStack deployment on top of Kubernetes became really complex. There is a lot of manifests, and those manifests are really long and really complex. Uh, and the key problem here is that uh, there, is, there was no like, mechanism which could prevent code duplication. So the same sections of the code were present in Nova API code, in the Keystone code, in their volume code, in Neutron Agent code. And uh, whenever you wanted to change something, you needed to go to 12 files to, let's say, you've discovered some problem or a bug and you want to fix that and you needed to fix that in, in 12 places, which, which is crazy. So Fuel CCP uh, was in the most lucky position because they have their own tooling and uh, they were doing a lot of templating from the Python code, but other projects like OpenStack Helm were not that lucky. Uh, because they simply relied on duplicating the same code in multiple files. So uh, there is a lot of efforts which are aiming to fix that. Uh, so the first, which is ha happening in Kubernetes, are pod presets. So you can simply create an object in Kubernetes, which is called pod preset, and then include this object in manifest. At the moment, those pod presets are uh, supporting very simple statements, but of course, it will grow with a time, and I hope that in the future, you would be able to template most of the container statements in the pod presets. And also, there are some separate efforts, like, like uh, creating manif Kubernetes manifest with JSON-Net, and this project is driven by Hept.io using their Libsonet project. So we had some very good experience with JSON-Net, it's Takanetis, and we really believe in that project that it will simplify a lot. And of course, Red Hat is also trying to solve that issue as well with their Open Compose project. And what we think is going to happen, uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks, couple of months. So w we see that Oslo community uh, figure out that uh, nowadays it's not really the desired situation where you hold all configuration in a configuration file, <laughs> that it's a good idea to hold some part of the configuration in etcd backend. And we think that uh, we should go even further that OpenStack on top of Kubernetes is like we have so many projects that we should uh, go and add uh, con Kubernetes config map backend to Oslo. So Oslo can read directly from Kubernetes config map objects. That would simplify a lot of deployments because you simply could forget about all the templating and mounting those config maps inside the containers. Uh, and the other thing, which is a bit more technical, this is shared pit namespace. So Docker recently introduced that multiple containers can share the same pit namespace. And I hope that the support for that will land shortly in Kubernetes. And this is extremely helpful in a situation where you have malfunctioning service and it's creating zombie process. Because in a regular container, there is no process init process which is with PID1, which can take control of those zombies. So SAP guys uh, find a workaround for that. So simply in every container, they run to dump in it software, which is taking care of that. Uh, but with shared PID namespace, we can have a cleaner solution where we still 
follow the best practices that there is only one application in the container, but this uh, dumping it could be deployed as a sidecar container, which is also having the same PID namespace as other containers and wipe those zombies on demand. And why we were fighting so hard to ensure that OpenStack itself is upgradable and there is a tool to upgrade the OpenStack, we forgot about Kubernetes upgrades. So this is very unlucky that uh, Kubernetes upgrades are not so easy right now. There is no tool which can orchestrate that for users, and which is even more scary. Uh, upgrade from Kubernetes 1.6 to 1.7 requires downtime of all services in Kubernetes. I mean, all containers need to be shut down and started again. I hope that this is only one-time action, that it will not happen in the future, <laughs> but it shows that uh, not everything is uh, perfect in our road. And also, resource isolation is coming to the Kubernetes, so finally we would have CPU sets. So, and this is for uh, control plane applications, which we want to ensure that they have central level of QoS, like API OpenStack services. This is very desired feature, so we would be able to have dedicated cores for the API services, which would not be uh, simply there will be no noisy neighbor problems for API services, and as we want our cloud to be running with the biggest possible uptime and be as responsible as possible to our users, this is a way to go in the future. And this is all, and now it's part for questions if there are any. Hey, uh, I heard you said uh, you solved the uh, MySQL uh, auto cluster problem. Did you use uh, uh, HCD, config map, secrets? How did you do that? Can you elaborate a little more? So, uh, solution is quite simple. Uh, simply, there is, before the actual MySQL instance is started, there is a script which connects to Kubernetes API checks the MySQL service in Kubernetes and check the endpoints. If there are any endpoints, it means that there are other members of this cluster, and then the script is setting those IP addresses which are extracted from this service as other members of the cluster, and then MySQL is booting up. So you can check it how it's done in Stackanetis in OpenStack Helm. Those are the tool projects that are taking advantage of this feature. And OpenStack Helm even reverted that to bash script, so it's like a very simple. Um, so, right here. Um, <laughs> uh, so, on that, as a follow-up to that, so for the database clustering, are you saying that the, the the stateful set is not being used, and do you see do you see that being used at some point later? Uh, yeah. So, like Stackanet is is not using a stateful set, but OpenStack Helm does use stateful set, and they use it because of the uh, predictable host name. So okay. it's not a random, it's let's say MariaDB0, MariaDB1, but the stateful set is again a, a bit problematic because stateful set controller does not offer upgrade, but you don't upgrade your database so frequently, <laughs> so you can forget about that. Okay, and uh, just uh, another one. Can, can you clarify what you did for RabbitMQ clustering? You mentioned something about etcd backend. C can you explain that? Uh, it was not me, so it was Mirantis who did that. Uh, so basically, they took uh, Auto Cluster plugin and he proved it a lot. So there was etcd back etcd backend in this cluster, but it was like very opportunistic, and in a lot of cases, simply RabbitMQ clustering was running out of sync. Uh, so there was a lot of race condition on the cluster startup and split brain situation. So Mirant is really hard on that part. And as I said, it's bullet proof and proven in multiple production clusters okay. at the moment. And, and what is that called? That Auto cluster plugin. Auto cluster plugin. Yes. You should go to a few LCCP RabbitMQ repo. So, and this is like a reference design, how they take advantage of that in their platform. Thank you. A great session, Thomas. Uh, I work in the call on call Kubernetes project. Uh, you mentioned uh, Oslo config. I uh, was just wondering if you guys did any integration with 
uh, Oslo logging and uh, the Cloud Native Fluent D logging uh, tool. And also, uh, how did you guys do monitoring? Did you guys use any Cloud Native Prometheus uh, uh, code at all, or you did uh, OpenStack uh, non non CNCF monitoring? Uh, yeah, so uh, we work at Intel and we use Snap uh, for all the monitoring related issues. Uh, so we even have a demo, and so multiple summits were seeing Snap demo. So this is the way how we monitor. But I personally use uh, Prometheus. So. <laughs> and did Oslo logging work out of the box uh, for you? Uh, Oslo logging, yes, but uh, in most of the deployments, we use basically redirect all logs to the uh, standard output. And the just, ELK stack, right? Yes, and, okay, thank you. Uh, and then you use, let's say, FluentD to collect those logs from the containers or from the systems. Cool, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.